Hey guys, this is Sergey, and today I want to talk about a slightly different topic. About two weeks ago, on June 12, Google broke a third of the internet, and I want to talk about how that happened and, most importantly, why it took almost three hours to recover even after rolling back the bad change. Ok, on June 12, Google Cloud started facing an issue in their control plane layer due to the code that was deployed several days earlier. This affected all the Google Cloud services, downstream dependencies, and key customers like Cloudflare, which relied on Google Cloud for their key operations. And that affected one-third of the whole internet, causing issues to millions of people. The most interesting part is the nature of the bug and why recovery took three hours, despite that the bad code was rolled back almost instantly. Here's what the issue was. The affected service managed quota policies. A new policy data introduced an unintended blank field. This blank field caused a null pointer dereference, leading the binary to enter a crash loop. The bad code was rolled back within minutes, but the restarts triggered a death spiral for downstream services. They were restarting simultaneously, causing an abnormal load. Also, exponential backoff algorithm was in place for retries, there was no randomization or jittering, so all the clients were hitting the backend at the same time over and over again. So let's dig into these issues. Tony Hoare invented null pointers in 1965 for LW to indicate a pointer that doesn't point to any data. In 2009, he gave a famous talk calling null pointers his billion dollar mistake. And I think it was a drastic understatement, since just this incident alone probably cost more than $1 billion in losses. The issue with null pointers were known way before the talk, and many languages adopted new techniques, like using union types for representing missing data. The widespread adoption of not nullable types in mainstream object-oriented languages began in the early 2010s and continued afterwards. One of the first object-oriented languages that fully adopted not nullability was Eiffel, developed by Bertrand Meyer, shortly after Horace's talk. And other languages like Kotlin, TypeScript, and Swift added not nullability as well. C Sharp introduced not nullable reference types in the version 8 in 2019. By default, null was always a valid value for all reference types. It means that if you have a local variable of type string or a parameter of type string, null was always an accepted value. But with not nullable types, the default is flipped. Now, if you have a local variable or parameter of type string, null is no longer a valid value. And it means that if you have two parameters and one of them is optional, we can clearly specify that. In this case, message is the required parameter and details is optional parameter. And the compiler will emit a warning if we'll try to pass null to a not nullable parameter. But because not nullable reference types are purely compile time feature, we still need to validate parameters at runtime because this method can be used from other languages or from other projects where not nullability is disabled. Serialization and deserialization is a bit more tricky, but we still can rely on not nullability to enforce some invariance. Let's say that we have a class called policy. We want to make sure that the name property is always there. One way to do this is to create a constructor and to make the property read-only. Another option is to make it required and init only. In this case, the compiler will make sure that the name is properly initialized in object initialization expression. And most popular serialization frameworks actually do support not nullable types in one way or another. Let's look at system text the JSON case. So we have a JSON that doesn't have our required parameters, and we can run the code to see what, what's going to happen. And as you can see, the deserialization failed because policy was missing a required property called name. But Newton's of the JSON handles this slightly differently. If we'll deserialize this case, we see that the policy is invalid. Instead of relying on required and non-required property, Newton's of the JSON relies on JSON required attribute. And now, if we'll run the code again, we'll get the deserialization exception. You might think that a deserialization error is very similar to a null pointer exception, but it's not. Enforcing object invariance early prevents the butterfly effect, where an issue in one part of the system affects another one later on. This is exactly what happened in the incident. Now let's explore why the recovery took three hours, despite the quick rollback. One of the key aspects of distributed systems is that the errors are inevitable. So instead of making one remote call, a typical pattern is to use some kind of a retry strategy. One option is to try multiple times after a fixed interval. This is not ideal, since it's hard to say what the interval should be – 1 second, 10 seconds, maybe 100. A better option is to gradually increase the interval – start with 1 second delay, then wait for 5 seconds, then 10, then 30, then 60, etc. 
This approach is called exponential backoff and is widely adopted by the industry. Let's mimic this behavior. Let's create a backend that is going to crash if more than five clients will call the method at the same time. We'll use minimal API here and we'll use .NET Inspire to visualize the metrics. The code is very simple. We use minimal API here to call our service. And our service uses metrics that we are going to see on the dashboard. And it also increments the number of pending requests. It waits for some time. It checks the number of pending requests. And if the number of pending requests is greater than or equal five, we'll fail. So if we have more than five requests at the same time, all of them are going to fail. And if we have less than that, we are going to succeed with some policies that the client can use. The client that talks to our backend is very simple. It takes a GP client in the constructor, then it creates a retry policy and we are using the exponential backoff policy here. So to get our results from the backend, we are going to use our retry policy and then if everything is succeeded, we are going to deserialize from JSON. I'm going to use VS Code today for all the demos because it's easier to use built-in terminal to see the output. Let's say that we have four clients and each of them is going to talk to this endpoint. Then we create four clients and then we call get policies async to get all the policies for each of them. And then we just await all the tasks. And if we'll run this code, we'll see that we, we got all the policies here. And if we'll open our Aspire dashboard, we can go to metrics, we can pick our service, and we can see that indeed we had at most four simultaneous requests. And because it's below our threshold, all of them succeeded. But now let's change the number of clients to five. And as you can see, all the clients are keep retrying, but they're hitting the backend at the same time. As you can see, we're hitting the backend less frequently, but we call it at the same time, still causing the backend to crash. And now, instead of using a typical exponential backoff algorithm, when each retry takes longer and longer, let's use something else. Let's use Jitter. The idea is that each retry is going to take a bit longer or a bit shorter. This policy is not available out of the box, and you need to add a different NuGet package to get it. So without restarting or changing anything on the backend, let's use the new policy. And as you can see, now all the five clients succeeded. Yes, they have to do a few retries, but each of them retried at a slightly different point in time, giving our backend the opportunity to process all the requests. And now if we look at our dashboard, we'll notice that only the first time the number of simultaneous requests was five, but then we had only three, and that's why all of them succeeded. Every non-trivial incident is caused by more than one factor. And in this particular case, it was also a combination of multiple things, null pointer in the reference and the lack of jittering in the exponential backoff retry logic. Non-nullable reference types are definitely not a silver bullet that will save you from all the null reference exceptions in your code base, but it's a nice step in that direction. I personally enable it for all of my new projects and for all the legacy systems I worked for, I am trying to gradually onboard them to make at least some of the invalid states impossible and move the errors from the runtime to compile time. I would highly recommend enabling non nullable reference types in your projects as well. The adoption is not simple, but this is a very useful tool to have. The retry policy seems simple, but it's actually a complex topic. At least check that you have the retries, not having them at all is very bad and that you have the exponential back off, preferably with jittering. If you don't have thousands of nodes, jittering is probably not very important things to have, but knowing that such problem exists might help you in the future. The examples that I showed here are available on GitHub. Links to GitHub and to other resources I've mentioned here today are in the description below. If you enjoyed this video, hit that like button, subscribe, and let me know in the comments below what .NET topic you want me to cover next. That's it for today, guys. Thanks for watching, be curious, and see you next time.